Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin with a, with a definition, and then I'm going to say something about my approach to supervision and some of the factors that I think that are present there in terms of internal processes and external processes. And then I'm going to give some different examples, which I hope will be different facets of the definition that I begin with. And then at the end, I shall say something about the supervisor's own supervision. Um, and then we can see whether or not this um, has really addressed what, I, what I'm bringing forward tonight. We know that reciprocity means, in its general meaning, give and take. And we know that it's a, a background feature of all productive supervisory relationships. But I'm bringing it to the foreground, and I will describe it by contrasting supervision and analysis. Because, in my view, that's exactly what reciprocity is in the supervisory relationship that it's an attitude of mind in which the supervisor performs the task of differentiating internally the supervisory from the analytic vertex. Now I begin um, from where Michael uh, has orientated this paper for me with his, his straightforward statement really that the analyst will know that every single statement he makes is an account of the state of his psyche whether it be a fragment of understanding, an emotion, or an intellectual insight. All techniques and all learning how to analyze are built on this principle. And it's thus part of the analyst's training experience to realize that he's often going to learn <coughs> sometimes more, sometimes less from each patient. And that in consequence, he himself is going to change. And that's about the only quotation tonight. Um, <coughs> I have this as a principle in the back of my mind as I'm working analytically, but I have it in the back of my mind when I'm working super as a supervisor as well. What do I think the essence of supervision is? I think that it is a space for thinking, and by that I mean that it is both clinical and didactic. And it's a space which has a certain quality of attention, not dissimilar to analysis, in that the communications are being thought about from the position of multiple vertices. It's like analysis, too, in that supervision leads to the internalization of a process and a model, which enables us to monitor our sessions. But of course it's not like analysis, in that systematic interpretation of the supervisor's transference to the supervisor isn't analyzed. Now, I said at the beginning that mutuality is a significant constituent of reciprocity, and I've talked about learning from the patient, learning from the supervisee, and learning from the supervisee's patient, all of which happens. And I'm aware that I have a relationship to my supervisee's patients, as well as to my supervisee, and that this can sometimes cause difficulties in their work. One of my supervisors said to me, I feel this patient is your patient, not my patient. <coughs> One of the things that I think is important to do also in supervision is to actually demonstrate that the, super, that the supervision is being monitored from the perspective of supervision, not just from the analytic perspective. You could say as you were listening, or I'd think, say to myself as I'm listening, that I'm paying attention to what's being reported, the way it's being reported, and what I experience while it's being reported. And while this is going on, I'm considering and rejecting hypotheses. And I'm thinking about this in the context of what I know about the supervisee, and that's quite an important one. Their characteristics, their tendencies to understand material in a particular way, and their residual psychopathology as it's revealed to me. There's nothing really sinister about that. What I mean by that is what Fordham says at the beginning, that every single statement an analyst makes is an account of the state of his psyche. Um, 
And technically this means that I often make use of questions rather than interpretations. You will all probably remember in a different context, in the context of analysis, a statement of Winnicott's to the effect that he shuddered to think at the amount of time he had wasted and the suffering he had caused by his own need to interpret. Well, we begin <coughs> in a supervisory relationship with getting to know one another. And all sorts of things can be stirred up by this process, and sometimes things that haven't been analysed. But very rarely have I found that it has created blocks that can't be unblocked. More often, it's really trying to find a common language. I can well recall one supervisee saying to me that she felt I was talking mathematics and she was talking intuition and passionate feelings. I was water to her fire. She was getting caught up and needing time to think about her entanglement and she thought of me as detached, schematic and very English. She talked about myths and I talked about the quality of the patient's internal object. But little by little she came to realise how much I appreciated her engagement with her patients and she in turn found her own way to use what I understood. Now another complication at the beginning of the supervision is the added weight of the supervisee's own internal historical relationships to their own internal objects. I mean to take for instance the statement that I'm very English mathematical and detached. I mean, it might have a superficial plausibility, but its significance as an opening statement is that it's evidence of residual transferences to the supervisee's own internal objects, in her case, her father. The other caution that I think needs to be exercised at the beginning, it may change as it goes on, is the need, is is not to be too collegial. There's a very good example that Epstein gives of how he started associating to a supervisor's material from material of his own. He said, oh, I've got a patient to stay there, and started talking on. And the effect of that was that the supervisee noticed that when he was next with the patient, he was inattentive. And he started associating in the session as to why he was inattentive. And he realized that what he had experienced when his supervisor had started talking about his own material was his own abandonment. The supervisor had left him, left the tension on his case, and was starting talking about his own material. And this had actually got into the therapy with his patient. The other thing that I think about at the beginning is what the focus is and how you need to keep the balance between the focus on the supervisee and the focus on the patient. I mean, too much focus on the supervisee can get rather persecutory. It can have, bring with it a sort of persecutory quality of the knowledge of hindsight. It can seem like wisdom after the event, as when in the legal context, encased in superiority and contempt, its tone becomes, if you know that now, why didn't you do something about it then? This, I think, is more present often in training supervisions than in other ones. Whereas in the context of my quotation from Fordham, wisdom after the event is learning from reflection. On the other hand, if you focus too much on the patient, then the effect can also be demoralizing for the apprentice analyst. When I was training, there was a supervisor who had a particularly evocative style with emphasis on embodied interpretation of infantile affects and fantasies and those supervised by him would hear him reinterpret their material. His style was hardly to focus at all on what the supervisee had said or what the nature of the interactions were. He but to say what he, the supervisor, had understood. Now while this could be inspirational, what it could also do was promote learning through imitation. And that, in my view, is a sure way to trample on the individuality of the patient and of the supervisee. For if the supervisor does not pay attention to the understanding of the supervisee, but only to the unconscious of the patient, the supervisee will find himself repeating the supervisor's formulations without being able to follow them up. And this is what Fiscalini, in an article, <coughs> called analysis by ventriloquism. 
<laughs> Which I particularly like as a phrase. <laughs> so, now we will get into some clinical examples. And one of them is one which we all encounter very often, which is that the supervisee comes and he's got an idea about the material, a theory, perhaps, but it's really, it's really a misconception. In the example that I'm going to give, the person who's bringing their material to me thinks that it is an attack on an enviable object. He thinks it's a, an instance of penis envy. And the background situation is that both the supervisor, supervisee and their patient are going in and out of the same building, which houses an institute which offers courses, training and treatment. And the material brought to the session that I'm going to discuss with you is that the patient been, has been attacking <coughs> the analyst by telling him that she was in the building attending a seminar at the same time as she knew him to be there. And she'd seen that he'd left a note for someone else at the front desk. And the patient is very angry about this note. It's not at all clear why, but the patient is very angry about this note, which is addressed to someone she knows, and she pours scorn on the size of the return address information. You know those little sticky things? <coughs> she just says this incy-wincy little sticky thing on the front there. <laughs> and she tells him that its small size indicates that he is a wimp, just a little man, just like her father. And there's a real tone that gets under his skin here. And he immediately picks up these things about size and thinks, oh, I know what that's about, <laughs> what's going on. And he, he, he's made angry by this, but he, he um, responds, I, I think, inappropriately. He goes on giving the account, and he says that he interpreted this as penis envy from an identification with the patient's father. And he said that he spoke to his patient as if with her father's voice about her denigration and contempt for him. There's two points here. There's one, the theory, is, about, is this about penis envy? And secondly, there's a way of talking about it. Well, I, I actually didn't agree with either of those. And I thought it was unwise to speak out of identification with a denigrated object, as this contains too much identification with the contempt. The analyst would be experienced, in my view, by his patient as being contemptuous of her intense feelings of hurt and anger. Rather, I was concerned with a significant other unconscious communication in the material concerning the analyst's involvement in the building with others and a response to this, which I didn't think was being addressed. I was understanding her attacking behaviour on him as defensive and that that hadn't been examined. I was interested in the two people in the building who were not meeting because I was experiencing myself with my supervisee not meeting him. I was wondering as I was thinking about this and what I was going to say whether the analyst who's talking to me is feeling in the session that I have an understanding of his patient which he doesn't and that he's being rather guarded with me and I'm wondering whether this is why he can't see what I think I can see which is the Oedipal nature of the, of the material and at the same time I was aware that he was very affected by his patient's contemptuousness and that he was somebody who can easily feel flawed orally speaking I mean the he feels knocked down, but he also feels that he is somebody who is flawed as a person. I, but I was, so I thought, well, I'll begin by trying to investigate why he was made so angry. So I began to wonder out loud, did he know what the patient's anger was about? Let's start with the patient's anger. And my supervisor replied that he didn't know. So I then suggested my Oedipal theory about his session, namely that the patient is angry with him for being in the building, seeing other people, doing interesting things with them, but excluding her. 
The analyst now tells me that there is to be a short break in the treatment and this is a session immediately prior to the break. He continued to bring forward associations which deepened the understanding of what we're now thinking about. He remembered that she'd commented as she'd come in on the two planters on either side of the door and her interest had been in the connections between their contents. Now I began to feel the supervision session is beginning to take shape. We had an ampas, we had a patient who felt misunderstood, and an analyst who knew something wasn't right because he'd spoken out of his anger. Then we had a way of thinking about the ampas, the Oedipal theory arising out of the material, which was filtered through the knowledge and history of our relationship, and then he brings his associations to this. So a fertile interaction could begin to occur. <coughs> The supervisee's further reflection was that his identification with the denigrated object, a bit of his own pathology, prevented him from seeing the Oedipal dynamic. This I didn't comment on, because I strongly disagree with supervisors who tell their supervisees to take such and such a feeling to their analyst. As if, I mean, really because we're analysts, not traffic policemen. I mean, apart from anything else, I think this comment usually indicates some rivalry or unexpressed hostility towards the supervisees and this, as if this problem wouldn't have occurred if somebody had done a better job. Hint, hint. <laughs> no. So, I recognize in this example that his being open and unguarded about the interaction with the patient enabled me to feel into it and to speak out of what I felt. By being receptive to thinking about my alternative suggestion and how I had derived it, he both facilitated further associative exploration of the idea and he elaborated it. I needed his response to, to work with and that he could quickly see, once we started on the Oedipal theme, that his previous position was not the significant dynamic of the session we were discussing. This enabled us then to move on to a further aspect of the reciprocity inherent in the supervisory relationship, which I had been developing with him, which was, what is it that happens between him and his patient that he gets embroiled by her in her drama in the way the material demonstrated. So that's one example which I'm characterizing as a misconception and a way of unraveling it and a way of trying to work with that. Now I'm going to give you another example where the transference is enacted. I was asked for a supervision session by a colleague who had a specific problem. On the telephone, he stated he had difficulty getting his patients to come more than once a week. In the event, when he came, he told me something of his biography and then gave an account of a patient who he felt treated him disdainfully. This patient was, while seeing him, also having consultations with someone else to see if the other person might be a more suitable therapist for, for her. And my internal commentary at this point was that this therapist was wondering whether, if he had a different supervisor or a different analyst, it would improve his work. He was having difficulty, in other words, about the feelings that were stirred in him, and he was looking elsewhere. He was looking around to see if he could find a way of, of getting to grips with this. He told me about his patient, who was rich, rather grand by marriage, while also not being quite at ease with their family of origin internally. And my hypothesis was that he had become identified with the projective identificatory content of her material, and this was probably due to some difficulty around envy. His envy, her envy, I wasn't sure. <coughs> but she talked a lot about her rather grand life, at the same time making self-depreciatory remarks about really she wasn't quite sure whether she was an imposter within this world. So my colleague now talked and talked and talked and he filled the whole session with the material. I had to know everything. I really had to be told everything. And he was determined to get through all the sessions that he bought and he bought three sessions 
for one 50-minute supervision. No time was left for discussion. And after 50 minutes, I indicated that the time was up and he could come back in a fortnight if he wanted to and we could go on with this. And he looked at me and he said in astonishment, is that all? Meaning, was that the best I could do? And I was put in the position at that point of the analyst supervisor who was not able to produce enough. Nothing at all, really. Which was exactly his dilemma with his patient and within his practice. He told me on the phone he can't get people to come more than once a week and he had told me that the patient he was bringing was going to other analysts to see, another analyst to see if we could find somebody better or different or maybe who could hit the spot in the way that he wasn't able to. So I felt I was at this point, the recipient of the feelings the supervisee had when he was with his patient, but which he was unable to interpret satisfactorily to her. So I said, this comment of yours, is that all, sounded like the sort of thing his patient said to him. And this made him laugh. I mean, he smiled and he said, yes, that's absolutely right. And I said, well, I think that is the transference, isn't it? And he said, yes. And he went away. And this pithy little exchange at the end of the session encapsulated the issue. He came, he worked on it in between time, and he came back. And when he returned two weeks later, he had digested it. He had internally elaborated it, so that without the boundary of our work being broken, he brought his material, and having acknowledged the significance of our exchange, he was freer of his identification with his patient's projections of inferiority and anger. And in consequence, he was able to work with these feelings inside himself and to work with the patient more productively. He was able to interpret the patient's consultations with the other analysts as a potentially better one, and it helped him realize that deepening his work involved a process of working with his own ambivalence as it was constellated in his transference to his patient. The question here in this transference problem brought to supervision, I'll formulate now here, in relation to us all sitting around here, talking about this. If what I'm saying to you now is making you pick holes in what I'm saying, one of the questions you might be asking is, whose problem is this? Is this your problem? Are you feeling rivalrous or envious or hostile? Or is it my problem? Is it my rivalry, my envy, that I'm projecting into you defensively as a way of protecting my own inner object from attack. And my supervisee, this supervisee, was struggling with just this problem. I'm now going to bring the third example, and this is the longest one. And this is the one that really, I think, showed me more about um, reciprocity than any of the others because it made me think about the relationship between reciprocity and analysis as an internal event. This supervisee brings process, rarely brings process reports. The notes are there, but what she does is she reads them on the way and then speaks out of her experience of the re-evoked material. <coughs> and I think that the reciprocity is the essential feature of our work together. The relationship is not analytic, but it has features which I will describe which are analytic. The material is nearly always about how she is affected by the patient, and often how she struggled to contain her anger or irritation or bewilderment within her professional persona. In other words, she is bringing a combination of unprocessed countertransference and projective identifications and a receptivity to thinking about new ways of understanding them. The supervision has a pattern. First she needs to be settled down, and this happens partly from the initial exchanges and her feeling that she has my attention, and partly from the way she pleasantly idealises her transference to me. Then she describes what's on her mind about her patient. My supervisee begins the meeting by saying how desperate she is feeling about a borderline patient who is screaming at her 
in the session that she, the therapist, is evading the big issue, which is that the patient insists on knowing whether she fancies her. It's a woman speaking to a woman therapist. Do you fancy me? The patient is yelling at my supervisee. You've got to tell me, do you fancy me? The supervisee tells me at this point that, the, that her patient was hospitalized when she was three years old. Her parents didn't visit. And the patient's parents' marriage was one where father screamed at and physically assaulted mother, usually when he was under the influence of alcohol. <coughs> Lots of things going through my mind at this point, not least of all the way patients make you feel like a child in the unconscious. Really. Something Michael pointed out years ago. But at this stage I'm proceeding analytically and I'm thinking that my supervisor is having difficulty how to convey to her patient that her patient's demand to know if she's fancied by her therapist is similar in feeling to, wanting, to her wanting to know whether her mother loved her. <coughs> Now, the obstacle in the way of any reference to a dependency need is that it's, it's just dismissed, treated with scorn because it's too painful. So any interpretive intervention that is reductive or too crudely reductive at this stage just doesn't work. It just bounces off. She needs something, this, this patient, which will help her overcome rather than defend against despair. And we're getting it here in the room. It's very alive in the room. So I say that I think that the patient is screaming like father screamed at mother, and that she, the therapist, is feeling terrorized, like the patient, like a child, and that she can't think what to think because she's terrorized. And the supervisee continues that the patient beseeches her to tell her that she's special, and she writes a letter between sessions telling her of her frustration and rage. And I say I think that she's frustrated that she doesn't have exclusive possession of you. And the patient, uh, the supervisee at this point says, well, actually her patient does complain that she can hear other people in the house. And she says this is inhibiting. And the tone of the complaint is rather threatening. So I say I think all of this is extremely complicated. It's part the patient's anxiety about her warring internal parents, part her feeling enraged that she's on the outside and wondering what she contributed to their fighting, and part an evocation in her of feelings arising from her identification with her patient as the unwanted child. There are three elements that I've identified. There are probably tons more. But what do we do? I'm thinking about this, and... I keep on noticing that the person who's presenting the material to me keeps on referring to this yelling voice which says, do you fancy me, as the erotic transference. I just can't get my mind around that. I think there's nothing erotic about this at all. And there's nothing erotic in these feelings at all. And so I say, I don't actually think this is erotic. I think that it's a dependent transference masquerading as the erotic, where the erotic is primarily aggressive. And this is the nature of the transference here at this point. It's very aggressive and angry she is. There's not an erotic constituent as you would usually understand that. I say that I think this patient is furious that she needs her analysis and needs her analysis and that the technical problem at this stage is to see the attack as a defence and analyse the defence and what's being defended against, especially the latter. I'm struck also by the tyrannical nature of the request. And so I initiate a discussion at this point about the age of the tyrant and the difficulty of thinking when being yelled at. And I recall the experience of containing the tyrant, of staying close but not giving in to threats. I'm imagining that the person is now a child and not this huge patient as we've heard. And I know that the supervisee has had children and brought up children and is familiar with children having tantrums. And I am trying to conceptualize the behavior as emanating from a childlike part of the self 
and describe what I imagine a three-year-old would be feeling when left in hospital and mother doesn't come to visit. And in particular, I'm wanting to bring out what I, that I think this three-year-old will be feeling that if she really, really gives vent to all her rage, she will feel broken up inside, that the breakup is not to the object so much as, as to the object inside her, her ego. Now this brings relief to the therapist in the session who I'm talking to, who can now think about the nature of her patient's insistence that she should become her lover. Do you fancy me? And I have in mind that the therapist's problem with this patient derives in part from, from an identification that she has with the patient at this point. Why does this bring relief? Well, I could say, well, we've conceptualized the material within the transference, but you might well ask, well, which transference? Because there are a lot of transferences going on here. What I think happens is that, that in a sense, <coughs> the exchanges that have happened between us has, has the feature of a form of auxiliary analysis, where I am showing her how she would like to be with her patient and how she is feeling like her patient at the same time. And this is all, con this exchange takes place in an atmosphere of familiarity, benevolence, acceptance of of these as present here in a non-judgmental atmosphere. And we agree that the patient's feelings about her object are subject to fierce ambivalent pulls of love and hate, and that these are regressive. We agree she needs to create in the transference an idealized object as part of a reparation. And I'm wondering whether she realizes that this is what in part happens here with me. And we agree that at some point the patient's denial of the loving aspects of the parents' intercourse. They are characterized only in the patient's mind as damagingly warring, has to be examined in the context of the patient's insistence that she, the patient, can supply to the therapist everything she needs, which is a reversal of what she actually wants to happen, namely that she should have the exclusive maternal attention of her therapist. All this, though, can wait. Really. The problem at the moment is that the patient is frus feeling frustrated, excluded, and this makes her feel violent. What sort of violence, we wonder? And we think about that together. Is this violence as a consequence of the deficiencies of her object? Or is it violence as a sadistic relish to it? Is she enjoying the whacking that's going on? And it seems mainly to be the former, being excluded from an ideal object is what enrages her. Now you might have thought, or I might have thought, of interpreting this in the old days in terms of part objects. And in fact, I wrote about that once. But I think it's more important to think about it in terms of function. Because talking about making interpretations at a part object level at this point, I think, um, is confusing really and it becomes too focused on on the concreteness of the mother's body. So together we start to speculate as to how to phrase the thoughts we're having about this patient and in doing this it emerges that the therapist is playing a sort of ping pong. The patient says, well you always say you have me in mind but I don't see how you can as you have all these other patients. We've all heard that a number of times. <laughs> and the supervisee replies in the same vein. Well, I know that makes you angry. We know that's something about that, where that anger comes from. So we've got a sort of backwards and forwards going on here around a defensive constellation. And the patient replies, yes, 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 I know all about that too. But what about now? What about here? And I suggest at this point to the supervisor that what she is not hearing is the statement the patient is making about the deficiencies in her object that she's very frightened of being left, that she's armoring herself against the ending of the session by creating a retaliatory atmosphere so she can storm <coughs> out and feel protected from any feelings of loss. What I'm trying to do is initiate a process 
which enables the person who has got identified and caught up with the material to think about what it is about this particular person that makes working with them so difficult. And as you can probably see from what I've described, there's an underlying meshing of the patient's drama and the person presenting, presenting it. So we then try out different interpretations and think about what you might be able to say. You might say, you want me to understand, you're terrified you might be left and abandoned and rejected. And I continue that depending on how this is received and assuming that it has helped to diminish the yelling, it might not have done, gradually one can begin to add in references to her rage and frustration and its effects on her own inner world, namely that she feels broken up by it. When she asks these questions, I think that all you can say to her, we, we think about this too, is you can say to her, I know you need an answer to your question, but I also know if I tr try to talk to you about this in relation to what I under have understood about the losses you've experienced as a child, it's just going to make you even angrier because you feel this is urgent, this is now, and that was then. As, as if you are dodging it, right? You, the analyst. And I think the patient needs this to be recognised. Now, this is actually what I understood Jung to have meant when he wrote of the real relationship, <coughs> which is necessary in analytic relationships. Real means understanding that what you're hearing is a memory in action. But the patient doesn't know this yet, and so she needs containing and not exposing. Because a reductive interpretation at that point exposes you to the shame of your infantile emotion. It also sounds accusatory. Later, you can, do, you can get into this, but at this stage, no. What I'm trying to demonstrate is that by responding in this way, the therapist stands a better chance of engaging the patient's imagination in the analytic process. I think what it also conveys is that the analyst has understood what the patient is feeling like, which is good enough. It's another matter, it's a completely other matter, whether the patient wants to understand what the analyst has said. This is why I suggested delaying at this stage all the additional observations. I'm particularly keen not to make borderline patients feel that their situation is entirely of their own making or due to their own nature. In this instance, that she was put in hospital because she was unliked and forgotten about and not visited because she was so intrinsically unlikable. Interpretations directed towards these feelings are deeply demoralizing and ego-weakening and destructive of the development of the resources within <coughs> patients to cope with living with our own mind, with our own mind. And we all know how difficult it is living with our own minds. We certainly don't want your analysts to make it any worse. In reflecting on the supervisee's contribution to the process of developing the analysis through supervision, I note that she uninhibitedly brings her feelings and her difficulties in her thinking. She listens and interacts with me, and this is a dialogue between us which has the characteristics of an inner dialogue, with my being able to articulate what, is, what she's really pre-conscious of. And to some extent, her transference to me reflects the transference in her case. What is inaccessible and strongly desired is idealized, and this protects dependent and denigrative feelings. I don't always have to know in this relationship, and she trusts me and the unconscious, and I trust her and the unconscious. And together, usually something happens. That's the um, example which, because I was proceeding analytically, but not intervening analytically, helped me think about what I'm calling reciprocity, which is based on an analytic process, but invokes the clinical and the didactic in what you give expression to, rather than the interpretive. 
Now, there are many ways in which a supervisor, a supervisee can use a supervisor, especially when the supervisee's material is very intense and painful. An example I'm going to give now is an example where the person who's bringing material to me is really very upset by it and the atmosphere is extremely intense and I'm the recipient of, of very strong feelings and I, what I understand my task to be as this is going on because clearly this, the problem is how do you think with all this intense emotion is to try and re-describe this out of my own experience of it the material that I'm being brought is is very uncomfortable. The patient is talking about how affected she, she has been. The, the, the supervisor is reporting that her patient is talking about how affected, how affected she has been by a friend of hers telling her that she locked her little girl in her bedroom at night because she wanders about. And the patient is upset, and the supervisor is upset too with this account. And I am affected by the emotional atmosphere as well. But my task is to bring out how the horrific nature of the story, which we can all imagine ourselves into, of a frightened little girl being locked into her room at night so that she's not a nuisance to her mother, can distract us from the analytic communication. For what I have understood from my listening and my distress is that the patient is feeling locked out and frightened and misunderstood in a vulnerable and childlike part of herself. In addition, she wanted her analyst, my supervisee, to know that she is ashamed to think that she has been a damaging parent herself. And it's quite a big gob of material, that, really, in that, just that little exchange with complicated and painful <coughs> and rather shameful feelings. In the context of the transference in the session, I thought it was my job to formulate this and point to where the supervisee has allowed her herself to become so emotionally involved in the horror story of the imprisoned child that she's not been able to hear the patient's communication. In my view, the patient is telling her that she feels that she could have been a mother who did not understand her child and that she is frightened the therapist might not understand her own childlike terrors, which are related to her feelings of being locked in and locked out. And there's probably behind this, I'm speculating at this stage, some terrifying primal scene fantasy. But uh, this is a long way down the line. So my task and reciprocity come together in my effort to demonstrate the capacity to think analytically, which I hope is going to be internalised, while being affected emotionally, and thereby to en enable the supervisee to interject this. I can't remember the numbers, but an, another example, which I will give before I get on to um, supervisor's own supervision. And this one concerns rhythm and reciprocity. Because one of the things that I'm sure we've all noticed in our interactions with supervisees, whether you're a supervisor, a supervisee, or both, is the way in which the, the rhythm of the exchanges is closely related to the material. Thus, when the supervisor is very anxious about what is going on, the supervisor becomes more active in trying to help contain the experience and makes more proposals and suggested formulations. If the patient is becoming less contained, the supervisor tries to be more containing. At other times, I think the supervisor is, as Margaret Rustin has pointed out, is the thinker of interpretive links. The example I give is, I, is from a session in which I'm listening to material from an experienced therapist who's analyzing an experienced patient. This is one of these patients who's going on and on and on in the training. And the links she was making were close to the material and to the point, but bouncing off. The patient was speaking about the difficulty of living in two places, a house in the country, and a little flat in town 
from which her husband went to work and which she stayed in three nights a week. And she described her behaviour in the language of performance and acting, getting my act together, was how the patient described her move from the country, no analysis, to London, three days a week, analysis. Now, at first, the therapist was interpreting this in terms of analysis in London, her different states of mind in which she lived, and relating it to the three sessions a week, and the non-analytic time in the country. But then I began to realise that there was a considerable anxiety in the therapist about the falseness of the patient's description in terms of getting her act together, and that her efforts to help her patient understand this were failing. This feeling the analyst had about her failure to get through to her patient was not uncommon in our experience of this patient. We had noticed that she had a way of not allowing the truth to touch her. I was aware that I was not being a particularly effective supervisor, and I was thinking about this and the material when I realised that the problem was getting her act together. It was about performance and all that that meant, and this is central to the whole process, especially the analytic endeavour. I suddenly realised that the patient was experiencing the therapist's interventions as just so much performance art. The communication inherent in the patient's performance was this inauthenticity, which matched the therapist's feeling of frustration that she was not getting through. The problem, as I understood it, was that the therapist was perceived by her patient as playing at being a therapist, while she played at being a patient. So the therapist interpreted, and the patient ummed along, and everybody thought this is what an analysis <laughs> is. And from the patient's point of view, this was all that was necessary. Each was in row, and the truth remained in the hands of an unseen author, who did not need to be consulted. Nothing else had to happen. All the terms of the analysis were being met. The therapist spoke, the patient responded. Not by letting words, feelings, images settle on her mind, not by savouring nor digesting, but by tasting, pushing away. The act of serving up the interpretation was the therapy. Q, you make an interpretation. I speak, Q, you make an interpretation. She didn't have to make any commitment, this patient, to what was said, just as she did not have to make any commitment to her own feelings, nor any commitment to the consequences of recognising what the implications of certain truths were. Once I grasped this, I could barely contain my enthusiasm <laughs> for this idea. <laughs> I elaborated at length and became active and descriptive and so on and so on and so on. That's the example of the rhythm backwards and forwards and deriving out of your own counter-transference, really, what's going on. What about the supervisor's own supervision? Some of you may recall an example I described from Fordham's practice in which he persisted in interpreting to a young boy in analysis with him that the boy thought that Fordham was stupid. And he kept on making interpretations to this boy, saying, you think I'm stupid to say this, don't you? you? You really think it's a stupid idea. You think I'm just one of these stupid analysts who says these stupid things. And the boy kept on saying, no, no, he was absolutely appalled that this man was, was using the word stupid and saying this to him, and he was, he was getting flustered and embarrassed. Paul thought about this afterwards. My aggression against this boy had interfered with my getting to understand what was going on in his mind. I had misinterpreted the child's feelings, replacing more subtle ones by a cruder statement, owing to the repression of memories relevant to a particular period of my own childhood. At that period in my childhood, I used to attack my mother, calling her stupid, a word I had evidently, a word I had repeated in my transference interpretations to John. Evidently, I had identified with the memory images and John had represented myself as a child, while I, ceasing to be the analyst, represented my mother. Well, I think that's actually a rather remarkable bit of self-analysis, and I don't know that we're all quite up to that, but I think what it does <coughs> encourage us to do is to listen very, very carefully to what your patients say to you and how they reply to you. <coughs> 
especially when they disagree with you. Because Fordham, in this analysis of his own response, was respecting his patient's defensive responses and thinking there's something in this, I just haven't understood it. And, realize, and when he realized what he had said was wrong, although he didn't know it at the time, that it was arising from his own attacks on his own maternal object, which he had projected into his patient. He knew that even if what he had thought was right, the way he was saying it was wrong, and he encountered this resistance. There's one other example that I want to give about taking your own work as a supervisor to a supervisor. Um, and it's an example really about, again, listening to the language and thinking about what your patients say to you. It's keeping in mind, or I'm trying to keep in mind, the thought when your patients are talking to you is what is the motivation? What's the motivation for the communication we've received? The example I'm going to give is from Anne Alvarez's work, where she realized that she was treating borderline patients to the same sorts of interpretations that she brought to neurotic patients. She realized that the neurotic patients had enough ego to com cope with the unmasking quality of interpretations, which were intended to reveal the depression behind the defense. And the approach necessary for a borderline patient, whose defenses are less manic and paranoid, but carry elements basic for development. Sorry, that sounds come out. Got to be good. In, the, in this critique, she distinguished between the grammar of interpretation, sorry, appropriate for neurotic patients, who have enough ego to cope with the unmasking quality of interpretations intended to reveal the depression behind the defense, and the approach necessary for the borderline patient, whose defenses are less manic and paranoid, but carry elements basic for development. In, a, in other words, she's understanding in the borderline patient that the defenses seem more like attempts on the patient's part to recover from and overcome states of despair. So she's taking her work to one of her supervisors. A little child comes into her, her consulting room and there's painters on the outside of the house and the painters are painting and the child starts to paint. And she interpreted to the child that he perhaps was wanting to show her how he would be able, like to be able to paint, like the workman. So he was making an interpretation about her omnipotence. And the child corrected her. Yes, I do, he said. I do want to, but I do work. That is what I do do, you see. And he was making a statement about his potency. She was interpreting his omnipotence, and he was making a contrary statement about his potency. And she was listening to this. Her would like to be able to do has been restated by this little boy as what I do do. The conditional's been removed. <coughs> the therapist's interpretation refers to loss and lack and depressive feelings and to the little child's absence of potency. It's really an ego-weakening statement in some senses. And Alvarez noted that the patient's correction referred to the need for her to recognize that he suffered a lifetime of humiliation about his inadequacies and is pointing out to her that he has the potential to become a competent painting man, potent and paternal and repairing the inside of the house. She gives another example about understanding your patient's motivation. When a patient speaks of wanting his mother there forever, do you understand this as a defense against sadness or as a statement about his urgent need for continuity of relationship with you? In this formulation, there is a continuity in the transference which can repair the internal object whose deficit is being referred to, in the, the latter, that is. In borderline patients, it's not unusual to encounter 
an object which feels to them to be irreparable. And if you interpret to these patients as you would to a neurotic patient, i.e. assuming that they have more than one perspective on their inner world, for instance, that they can feel sad and feel sad that this makes them sad, you do not take into account the deficit of their object. The consequence is that the patient feels accused of being totally responsible for the state of affairs. Blamed, despondent, despairing, no hope of change. And this can prolong treatment since it does not allow the possibility of an object that can be repaired. This came out of her reflections and on how she interpreted and how she taught other people to interpret. I haven't included material tonight on the numerous ordinary supervisions which form part of the training and I haven't brought the process reports. I've had some wonderful experiences of people who have been doing the training who have brought detailed accounts typed out which they've handed to me and we've really been able to go through these accounts in the most ex interesting and detailed way to reveal both their assumptions and their patients' assumptions and the way these have and haven't met in a way that's really been very valuable. And in the first version of this paper, I included a lot of that, but as you realise, I've spoken for an hour already. So what I would like to say briefly is that, is that while I think these detailed reports um, are very valuable and do bring, ob really hone your observational skills, <coughs> I, I'm sorry not to have been able to, to include them tonight. What I have identified as elements in the reciprocal relationship of the therapist and supervisor focus on the deployment of analytic skills in indirect and non-interpretive ways, which I think are based on trust and motivated by a non-judgmental goodwill towards the enterprise. And that's what I've tried to demonstrate in this. At, at this point, I'm going to leave and, I'll, and throw it open for discussion. I'm sorry there's rather a lot in all of that. <coughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you. Well, it seems to me that the, the relationship between supervisor and supervisee is emotionally, can be emotionally very charged, of course. And uh, there are transferences and counter-transferences going on. Uh, for example, you might be, um, well, your supervisee might be the little girl who is <coughs> locked in a separate room, or she might feel that she plays, uh, she acts uh, supervision uh, in her relationship with her supervisor. But my, my problem, what I would like to Mm. to understand or to explore is uh, um, how when these transferences uh, come up how appropriate is it to interpret them not only but to interpret them ex explicitly not only to have an interpretation um, well or to have an internal understanding of these transferences but actually to talk to the supervisee about uh, what is going on transference-wise between supervisee and supervisor. Mm, recently I had a, a very unfortunate experience myself in my professional work with a supervisee who went mad and uh, she developed, uh, unbeknown to me, some um, delusional transference uh, which included me. Well, it, it was centered on me. And I was not aware of it, and uh, unfortunately became aware of it when it was too late. And looking at it retrospectively, I thought, well, maybe if I had been able to pick up signs, but not only to keep these signs uh, inside my own head, but to talk to the supervisor about uh, these um, emotional experiences that she was having in relation to me, who oh, no. I thought I might have been able to help her and I might uh, have been able to avoid a breakdown, in fact, which was perhaps partly due to my inability 
to, to understand what was going on in my consulting room between me and the supervisee, you see. So I wonder whether you've got any thoughts about uh, that aspect. Well, I, th I would like other people to comment on that. Part of the difficulty was not spotting it, wasn't it? <coughs> Part of the difficulty you described was not spotting it till it was too late. <coughs> and there isn't an interpretation for that. Oh, well, th the point that I wanted to, um, to explore was how appropriate is it to interpret yes. transference with a supervising. But this transference that you've described was a transference that you didn't know about till it was sort of till it was too late. Is that right? Mm. But maybe yeah, yeah. And then it became delusional. But if uh, I had been more open to interpret the little signs that retrospectively I could in fact identify, <coughs> and uh, maybe a breakdown would have been avoided, because then she went off sick and it was. Uh, Pretty grim experience. But human souls, right? In terms of Jones's paper, were you experiencing in the supervision not enough of this sort of repro um, reciprocity, reciprocity, that the supervisee was was either passive or idealising you too much, or I mean, what were the clues that you might have got? Because I mean. That, in a way, isn't it, that what one has to think about which is what is the nature of the exchange that's going on between mm. the supervisor mm. and the supervisee, mm. and that one sometimes it's brought to attention if you feel that this is interfering with how the supervisee can work. So if you've got a supervisee who's idealising what you say and is actually passive, then that is in the work as well. Mm -hmm. So that then, some way, you've got to get to grips with that. I mean, mm -hmm. you may try and work at it through the, their work with the patient, but you may have to bring it up. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, was it feeling like a, a good exchange in the supervision or not? Well, it seemed the two, but certainly there was that kind of idealization that mm. you mentioned. And uh, maybe, but you see, the therapist was also being idealized by the patient. Mm. And if I was able, in fact, to, to point out uh, the transference implication that mm. was going on between supervisee and supervisor, yeah. Including that idealization, mm. maybe the whole process would have been better. But my attitude was well, I can't interpret uh, with um, um, my supervisee because she's got her own therapist. Mm. She will sort these things out. So but I was kind Were you interpreting to your supervisee that, that, that his or her patient was idealizing her? Yes, yes. So the, the focus was on what is going on between patient and therapist, but another focus of what was going on between supervisee and supervisor wasn't really dealt with in, in a way that I wonder whether should have been dealt with more, well, I, more yes, closely. I have, yes, I would have thought that the measure of that, as has just been said really, is um, because I think the problem of a split transference usually comes in the form of preventing the two of you from working on looking at the patient therapist relationship. Um, that the, there's too much um, uh, emotion in the here and now relationship. Um, so that it would seem to me that it's appropriate to address that in order to get back into a working relationship. Because it, if you're not able to supervise because there's too much emotion in the here and now, then somehow or the other that has to be addressed, it seems to me, in order to get back to a working one. And, and of course, it, if you're addressing it and it's, it's looking increasingly like it's not going to get back, mm. then obviously other measures have to be taken. Um, but I, it would seem to me that that's the measure 
If there's something preventing the supervision from taking place, then it needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the way you have written in your paper, and um, I think particularly early on, you were talking about not making interpretations and asking a question. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you had, would have asked a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As a well, way of not making an interpretation. <laughs> Well, yes, the example I gave was a little one, wasn't it, where the, where the person spoke all the time and then said to me in rather an upset voice, is that all? And they would immediately got into the transference of their patient with yes. me. Mm. So by, by just saying, well, I, I wondered whether that observation is that all, that feeling that you have, you know, that I really haven't produced very much after this 50 minutes mm. and whatever my fee is, right, um, was, you know, the nub of the matter. Yes, mm -hmm. I can see that. Mm. Mm. You, you you did interpret um, the transcripts. It's not really well. interpretation, is it? Well, maybe. Well, that's that's no, I think you were. I <laughs> think you were doing this yes. very thing. I think you were addressing the here mm. and now problem yeah. as a mm. way of getting back to the work, to which work. is what mm. which they, happened. what happened. Mm. Yes. Mm. One may feel timid when I used to <laughs> feel timid <laughs> about making that sort of link. Mm. Yes, well, I think we should all feel timid about it, actually. <laughs> it's reasonable, it seems to me. But I think we all also have to take risks. I think oh, that's yes. also what we're uh, talking Especially about. when it, the sense mm. of urgency, and I'm sure that that would grow. Mm. As well as the block that you're prevented from functioning as a mm. supervisor. Mm. But I wonder if there was something in your perception of your supervisee and the patient. It might have, if you had been, get, got more, found out what was going on between them, that this might have helped you to know what's going on between you and this supervisee. In other words, looking at the patient, supervisee's patient, and their work with the patient, mm. would you have found something there mm. that, that would, would that have helped you mm. feel what you're doing, what's happening mm. to you? Well, it was to do with uh, an idealized and mother, very powerful mother, but also rejecting and unavailable. She was too, mm, too perfect and and unavailable mm -hmm. on that. On those. So there was plans. illusion going on between the, the supervisee and the patient. She was aware that the perception of her mother was illusory. It, yes. Was either mm. idealized or denigrated. Mm. But at the same time, I think that I was receiving messages uh, that mm -hmm. I was also unavailable. Uh, I was no, yeah. um, mm -hmm. my my stuff was not really usable. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't really make much. Sense. It sounded perfect, but in reality, it didn't mm -hmm. make sense. But you, you see, I think that this. I mean, what Rosemary is talking about, it seems to me, is is, is the parallel process mm -hmm. and how we can yeah. use that. And when you recognise the parallel process, you can use it and it's received mm -hmm. um, but if it's not received then you know that you're dealing with some, another problem I mean I remember Louis talking about this as a, a split transference where um, the, the supervisee saw the patient as a springboard into their own psychology and uh, and that that was what the supervisee focused on the whole time was their own mm -hmm. psychology which was in, in they were in other words insisting on Louis being the analyst and, uh, and, and that had to be addressed in another way, because uh, that wasn't a parallel process, whereas I think what you're describing is. Mm -hmm. And, and one, you can usually make use of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. But there is the question about where is the opposite? I didn't understand whether this supervisee had an analyst. I mean, was there a mm. denigration, a, 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 as it were, a parallel failure mm. of an opposite kind going on somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Which I think is very paralyzing. Mm. Okay. Is if you can't get hold of the hatred, yes. it's very hard to deal with the idealizing. Mm. 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 Mm.
the supervisee wants to Could you speak up a bit, please? We can't hear. Can hear. Oh, well, well, yes, could you speak up a bit? Could you say um, that again, please? I'm just saying that isn't there always a sort of mutual sense by proxy element in supervision where the supervisee wants to be seen through bringing the patient? I'm not sure I'd use that parallel. Isn't mm -hmm. the Munchausen parallel where you are making somebody ill intentionally? Mm -hmm. yeah, I can well, see that. Yeah. I was thinking of the delusional... Proxy, I think, what you're talking about. <laughs> It, it was around your delusional transference mm -hmm. and the therapist actually becoming it. Your, your supervisor mm -hmm. becoming it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I wondered also if the split was also between you and the analyst of, of the supervisee. Mm -hmm. Where the supervisee was perhaps perceived in one way, contrary to, to you. And she idealized you as a supervisor. What did you do with our analyst? And did, did it was a split there between you and the analyst. Mm. Mm. Yes, yes. Mm. She would be satisfied with that. Mm. 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 That was that yeah. polarized the split. Mm. 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 So it's interesting to me that you felt responsible for her sanity. Yes. You were the one that felt mm. well responsible. Yeah. Mm. Was, I suppose. Yeah. One might think the analyst would feel responsible, and presumably did, but, but you felt a weight of responsibility. Yes, I was invested analyst. with yeah. that mm. projection. Mm. 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 It makes me wonder how much, in, as a supervisor, you can explore or may know what's going on between your supervisee and their analyst. Mm. 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 That's enough, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have some ideas about that? No? Yes. Mm. What? Mm. No, no. I, R Rosemary, do you have some ideas about that? That's a very... Uh, it's like dropping a pebble in a pool, that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you explore the supervisee's relationship with their own analyst, is the question but you That's ask. the problem. Yeah. As, a, as a supervisor. Do you, do you think you can? Well, it depends on what goes on between you and... I don't know. Obviously, we, we can't know too much, about, or we don't usually want to know much about it, because we keep saying we mustn't tell you take take your stuff to your analyst. So we know nothing, perhaps, much about the analysis of our supervisee. And how do we de go around that one? But well, one of the things that I was saying was I thought we did. Mm -hmm. I thought we did discover quite a lot about our, um, our supervisee's analysis in, mm -hmm. in the particularly the, well, perhaps the lacunae of unanalyzed um, yes. areas which yes. come out in the yes. way they handle mm. material. Yeah. I, yeah. I, think that, I think this is an interesting one. I mean, uh, Louis, I remember talking about supervision as being a shared fantasy, yeah. that the, uh, the, the supervisee has a fantasy about the patient and the supervisor has a fantasy about the patient and they share this fantasy together. <laughs> um, and I think that the complicated thing is that there are other fantasies, and equally important fantasies are the fantasies about the supervisee's analyst. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and the analyst's uh, fantasies about the supervisors yes. and what, and what yes. they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I think that, that, uh, that Michael's comment is, uh, is well worthwhile listening to here, that uh, our fantasies about other analysts are probably a reflection of our own psyches rather than mm. anything to do with the actual analyst. Mm. 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 <laughs> well, in the older days, uh, the same uh, training analyst was uh, this, the, uh, well, the therapist's anal own analyst, wasn't it? Mm. Mm. Yes, that's right. And there was some sense in that. Uh, well, uh, there was a lot of omnipotent sense in it. <laughs> <laughs> That brings us back to the paper, mm. doesn't mm. it? Mm. Yes. Mm. Lauren, you were going to ask something. Well, yes, it was in some way related to what you're speaking about. It's something that you made um, just a brief reference to, which is the impact or um, the differences in a, in a training supervision, mm. having only more recently come out of the training. Um, I wondered if you could say a bit more, um, particularly when you were making reference to sort of various Oedipal dynamics, and I wonder whether the whole impact of being in the training 
with a variety of supervisors, um, not only the supervisors for your training patients, but often a third supervisor who may or may not be in the society as well, as well as an analyst. And whether you could say a bit about the specialness of that or the difference as you see it. Gosh, well, that is another, a slightly another paper, Lauren. I have, <laughs> tried, <laughs> I have tried a little bit to address it from the point of view of the internalization of the institution in mm -hmm. the previous essay that I wrote right. on this. Um, <laughs> I would rather other people spoke about that experience of their, because there are many people here who have recently qualified, about their experience of being in the training and how that, you know, I myself notice there's a tremendous difference in working with people who mm -hmm. have, have come because yeah. they've gone out there, they've got into a muddle, they, you know, they've got going in their work, they've got into a muddle and now they want to come and sit and think and talk about it. It's quite a different atmosphere because there isn't the pass or fail element, there isn't all the, mm. the other elements that they bring with them to do with the obligation yeah. to do this. It's something that they really want to do. I'm not saying that it's all characterised negatively because mm -hmm. it's a training, but it's also you're not necessarily bringing the patient that you want to bring to the supervisor. Yeah. That's the other mm -hmm. factor. Whereas when you choose, you do think, well, I would like to take, I mean, I have quite intentionally taken certain patients to certain people, to see whether they could understand them, because I could, and see whether they could. Mm -hmm. um, but on the specific thing of the Oedipal content, I think you'd have to give examples, and other people could give examples of that as well, mm -hmm. perhaps. Mm -hmm. I would like to say something. I, um, you were talking about not interpreting, um, making interpretations or analytical interpretations to the supervisee. Um, but I have a feeling if I were in supervision with you, which I never have been, um, that from the way you've been talking, I think it would <coughs> begin to feel that there was a, something tacit, a tacit analytical alliance is what I've written down. I mean, there is something highly analytical, isn't there? But going the, between on. what, the supervisee mm. and the supervisor? Yes. Transference. Mm. Transference. Yes, but it's, it's, it is being analysed. In projection. It's being analysed in projection, that's what I was trying to describe. It's not being mm. analysed systematically and reductively, it's being analysed in projection all the time. Mm. Mm. So I'm analysing the projection to me mm. in projection in relation to the patient, and, mm. and we'll get round yes. to it, but I'm not saying, I'm not doing it in relation but to... There, but there is analysis going on for the... Uh, well, we're all thinking analytically, aren't yes. we? We're doing the best we can, anyway, to think analytically. Mm. Mm. Yes, yes so I mean, ev even your questions um, are, are um, or questions are, are very potent. Mm. And mm. I feel there's going to be a, a lot of self examination and self searching. And That's a good idea. Yes. Mm. Mm. Um, well, I suppose it's interesting you see that we, we are trying to learn all the time about how to supervise and. But my observation is that, and I'm sure this must be true, particularly, for example, in our society, where uh, people choose their training supervisors. They're not allocated their training supervisors. I mean, I don't know about James, but I think that I attract certain sorts of trainees because they project certain things into me. So over the years, I've had quite a similar range of people um, and there's been one central issue which has you know brought us up against a, a wall after a bit because I think on the whole I tend to attract projectors of being a great mother you know so I get that sort of person who comes for and I'm sure you must attract uh, a different sort of projection <laughs> I think that's why we use our stuff. To speculate. Somebody else would like to. Right? I think the thing that struck me so much is how much. Well, one of the things that struck me from your talk was how much the supervisor actually 
I don't know if I want to say tapes on or tapes in, <coughs> and how when you were describing the um, supervisee whose patient kept saying, you know, are you attracted to me, or whatever mm. she said, mm. I, you said that there was a lot of feeling in the room, of mm. this damage, and I wasn't sure whether you were talking about this room, mm. or the room between your patient, because certainly in this room, I think also, Mm. that you'd actually brought into this room that feeling from that session, which is terribly moving. And the amount that you are having to take in of these various patients and these various supervisees and <coughs> what's going on is just astronomical mm. and actually keep inside so that it comes out goodness knows how much longer after in a room like this and still that feeling is alive mm. and still it's there. And there's no question in this, really. It's just a statement. But. Mm. Mm. Yes, and I, and, and I suppose that um, <coughs> what I would like to add to that, it, because I, I think that... Um, James's presentation may, in a way, be deceptive because, um, I mean, I know <laughs> from the way James, is, James works that there is a lot of digesting of that kind of emotion. Mm. Um, in other words, there is the not knowing and the processing of it. Uh, because I think your presentation this evening could give the impression that um, I knew what I was doing. You you knew what you were doing. <laughs> That's right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Very misleading. That. <laughs> uh, and the, and and yet we could, one has to allow for that. I mean, that's the mm. holding those I I experiences and, and processing them inside yourself, and is an, a vital part of it all. It seems to me, and I know that that's the way James works. As I understand it, you were saying that um, much of, or a source of information about the patient comes from the supervisee that you take in and work with analytically, but comment on via comments about the patient, not in a, in a, in a, in a veiled way, but as part of work of supervision. And from Lorenzo's circumstances, I thought that you were saying that there are occasions in which comments would be made ab about what is received from the supervising, not in projection about the patient, but, but direct to the supervising, mm -hmm. and that a risk should be taken. Can you say a bit more about circumstances in which that might be done, or the kind of thinking that might be done about whether that is done not in projection but directly. Um, yes. Uh, well, the example that comes to mind immediately was somebody who I could tell from what what they brought back each week that they were not making very much use of what I was saying. Um, and I had tried the method that I described to you, which was, I wonder why your patient doesn't make any use of what you say to him, <coughs> and, and elaborating that theme. And this wasn't getting anywhere. So I did say, after a little bit, um, that do you think we ought to think about the fact that what I say to you, you don't have a very good regard for? And and simply take it up directly with me, because I thought well, otherwise we would just continue wasting wasting our time, and that did that did that did help. I mean, the the person was in the throes. I didn't know that at the time. Were trying to discover whether they really wanted to do this work, and they were in a conflict uh, 
as to what their real vocation was. They eventually became a priest, but at the time they couldn't make up their mind whether they wanted to be a priest or a, or a therapist. They wanted to get engaged in the pastoral care and helping people, and they had laudable ideals, but they weren't quite sure how to apply them. And I was getting very denigrated as somebody who was being very analytic with their material. But it came, maybe not directly, but, it's, but it started with a with question. It starts with a question as to why, why do you think your patient doesn't mm -hmm. make any use of what you say? But that was your question. That's my question. Mm -hmm. I start with a question. Yes. Mm -hmm. And to see whether this promotes mm -hmm. a reflection, because if anybody's thinking about parallel process, they start mm -hmm. thinking, oi, oi, mm -hmm. what's yes. he saying, you see? Yes. He's saying, I'm... You know, basically, I, it goes in one ear and I don't pay a blind bit of attention. I've got to go to this thing, so I go to it and I do the business and then I clear off again and carry on just the way I've always carried on. And that is inevitably revealed in their contempt, in the little things. You, know, the, you can get little things, a little bit of tardiness, a little bit of lateness with fees, a little bit of this, a little bit, and gradually you build up a picture. All the cues come together into something that you you can get a picture of, as you would analytically. It's the same sort of thing. You're, you're, you're working in the same way. But you became more analytic, it seems to me. This was, a, this was yes, this is an exceptional example of, um, of whether or not to intervene. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I've also stopped supervision. I've <coughs> also, I mean, where, where somebody had a delusional transfer to me, which is different from your one, yeah. but it was saying, I have stopped supervision. I was so, in the about mm, mm, mm. mm. Well, that wasn't, a, that was stopping. Ending a supervision is different, I think. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Could you talk a bit about that? That's quite difficult. Three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. I'm sure there are many more people in here who have experienced the, um, bringing it to a close. I mean, I find people go on for quite long, quite long periods, so I have thought about this, because mm -hmm. I have thought, well, they must have got it going now. But then I also think, well, if it is the only occasion in the week when you are talking in a focused way with somebody else, why should it ever stop? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what the question then becomes mm -hmm. for me is, has this person learned all they can learn from me? And uh, when we're talking about ending, are we talking about changing? Are we talking mm. about having a break mm. and going to someone else? Mm. Which is the way I try and encourage it. Because mm. I actually do think if you are doing this work, there is so much stuff you can't process, there's so much stuff you can't think about, mm. that everybody needs something mm. which yeah. is like a sort of supervision, yeah. whether it's a group, or you're talking to, somewhere mm. where you can think and talk and hear, hear what you have to say mm. and, and think about other people's work too. Mm. Mm. Um, but don't you think, I mean, there's a huge, again, like everything, there's a huge variation. Some trainees finish immediately, they've got their membership. Some people like to go on for another six months because they feel liberated once they've got their membership to stay with the same supervisor. Um, so I think it's very, it's very individual how, how you end. I think the ending in the training is like that to some extent. I'm really thinking about more the ending of the of the person of yeah. the chosen supervision. Yeah. Yeah. I think most people, I, well, I don't know most people, many people are ending in the training just want to get shot at in the training. Yeah. It's such, it's such a damn nuisance going out every night. All these yeah. nights you go out yeah. and all this thing going on and so on. Long. It's relentless, mm. isn't it? So By the time you finish, you just think, I just can't do any more. No. I've <laughs> had it, you know, I've had it up to here. Yeah. I'm, you know, I've spent a absolute fortune mm. in doing all of this mm. enough enough mm. and you have to have a breather and recover yeah. get into muddles and then, and then start again yeah. <coughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. yes i think there's another uh, thing to to add to that i remember having one uh, supervisor who went on well beyond the uh, their membership and and so on and um my feeling about that was that um and that, that this is what I suggested in the end, that they got into a peer group supervision. Mm. Um, because I felt that that was an experience that they needed, where there was this, you know, as we were talking <coughs> about earlier, it's very, very easy to see the supervisor as the one who knows it mm. all. Um, and if you get into a peer group supervision, then you become aware of how each of us doesn't know what the hell's going on. Mm. And, and, and sharing that experience uh, can have a, 
uh, valuable it, uh, in itself is a valuable experience. Mm. Yes, I left out, I mean, um, and I will put it in in the final version because of your comment here, I did leave out the examples where I, I give quite a lot of detailed material about and I haven't a clue what's going on. Yeah. Right? And then what happens. <laughs> right? I gave tonight the examples where I had a clue what was going on, but the ones where I don't Eventually. have a clue. Eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's time to stop. Um, thank you very much for yeah. a very rich paper. Mm. I think there's a great deal in it, and I think probably it will take time to be digested. Yes. Mm. Complexity. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.